I think that to re resituate the maiden, it is to say, yes, maybe she doesn't have the extent of life experiences that the mother or the crone has, but she is moving from a place of vital truth as her centering detail or archetypal principle. Welcome to Soror Mystica, a podcast exploring life's mysteries and magic through its symbols. I'm Mariana Lewis, an archetypal tarotist. And I'm astrologer Christina Farella. And just as the Soror Mystica guided the alchemist through his holy work, we hope to be your mystic sisters in these conversations, guiding you deeper into the symbolic life. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the 19th episode of Soar Mystica. Today, we are talking all about the maiden, which is very special and gorgeous, and it's going to be probably a very very juicy conversation. Um, And I wanted to remind everybody before we jump into it um, that the Archetypal Tarot School has just a few days left. I think only um, maybe two or three days left of sales at this point that you're listening to it. So if you were interested at all in taking your tarot practice deeper, there is still time to jump on that bandwagon and do the thing and come, come learn from me and my tarot brain. Um, so Can I chime the- in? yes, please. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Um, <laughs> By the way, Christine is here. <laughs> this is like the hey. Mariana show to start. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> We're here together. (laughs) It's okay. I just wanted to say, um, and maybe I totally cut you off, but I was excited that um, the Archetypal Tarot School is incredible. I'm somebody who came to um, the Archetypal Tarot School with familiarity with the tarot, with Mm -hmm. confidence with the cards relatively, but knowing that there were things about it that could be strengthened in my practice. And Mariana's perspective with her depth psychology framework and also just the way that she orients you to the the symbology of the cards is really super powerful and has totally changed the way that I look at the tarot from like reversals and court cards to um, just the way that we think about the sequencing of cards and and any spread that you do so I can't recommend it enough I know that I'm her pal but that's my genuine just experience with it so thank you very much I really appreciate that um and that I'm, it's very uncomfortable to talk about the things that you do, um, even, even when you do them well, um, which I know I, I, my course and all my stuff, I, I have a lot of pride in, in the quality of the content, but it's still weird to talk about. Um, and just a note, I know that there's a lot of people out there, they're like, I'm just getting started with the tarot. So this time around, I, I actually, um, Earlier this year, I taught a Foundations of the Tarot workshop for those ultimate beginners. So you can actually bundle it this time, which um, was a brilliant idea (laughs) to like, oh, yeah, (laughs) I was like, right, like we can actually give people the opportunity to like do both of these things and save Mm -hmm. money. So that's available, too. So anyway, enough enough advertising ourselves onto the show. Let's talk about um, what we're reading. So what are you reading? I am reading right now um the book that i was kind of consulting for this episode which is the Core goddess uh by saffron rossi so i'm going to read to you all from it in a little bit but for those who are interested in the persephone myth or in the kind of um, symbolism of the maiden in ancient greek religion and ritual and art uh, it's just an excellent study and saffron rossi is a depth psychology person herself. So yep. I think that she's a, I think she's an analyst. She I'm is an analyst. And she went to Pacifica. She's a Pacifica yes. person. So yes. super smart, super interesting free mm-hmm. book. Yeah. Mm-hmm. When I um I've had in my life like I want to say four different analysts, I think. Um and one of them in there uh, was like a, kind of like a obsessed with Saffron Rossi and she talked about her all the time. And mm. I was like, that's cool. She also made me give her my birth chart before we started analysis. Oh, that's <laughs> like, so I guess she had to like make sure it wasn't a crazy person. <laughs> Stars will tell me. Um, but yes, that was cute. <laughs> um, well, that's good. That's lovely. I want that. I want to read some, some of Saffron's work at some point. 
Um, I am not reading anything new. I, I started um, the um, Paradiso finally. And nice. I'm in the last leg of the Dante journey, but I've just started, so I have no thoughts on it yet <laughs> other than, okay, <laughs> here we go. <laughs> um, and But I am listening to a podcast that I want to talk to people about because um, some of you may have interacted with the wonderful Emma Frey before. Emma Frey is on Instagram as Pattern in the Stars. It patterns in patterns. the Stars? Patterns mm-hmm. in the Stars, yes. Sorry. Um, and Emma actually just released her own um, podcast, which is called Star Rolls. And so I just listened to the first episode of that, and I'm very excited about it. Um, Emma's a good friend of mine and ours. You are on this podcast. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So at the time that this is released, I don't know if your episode will be out, but – People should go listen to it and listen to Christina's episode. I haven't yet, so I'm very excited for it. I haven't yet either. I just mm-hmm. did it. That episode is on um, the mythic visions technique of Amazing. like reading mythology into the charts. So it'll be on brand for Sora Mystica peeps to hop on over Definitely. to Star Rolls. It's so interesting because the podcast is basically like um, – it's an astrology podcast, but it's not like here's what astrology is or here's your horoscope, right? It's like – Let's talk to the best people in the business who have the most interesting and unique and and deep perspectives on how to work with astrology. And let's just see what we can learn from them and, and talk about how they approach it, which is really refreshing because it's, I feel like with astrology, you just get told a lot of stuff mm-hmm. and you don't necessarily get to understand how people arrived at their expertise and their perspectives and how that can shift your own. So this is a great idea for a podcast and I'm really glad that Emma put it together. Um, so definitely check out star rolls. It'll be worth it. I'm enjoying it. Um, okay. So I think we're, we're ready to jump into talking about the maiden. And, um, I wonder if you have, I always, always make you start and say, give me information from the book. (laughs) Read read to me. (laughs) I love to read to you though. So that's okay. Um, yeah, I think so. You know, we wanted to, think about the maiden, um, you know, at the time of the, like, by the time people are listening to this, it's Virgo season Mm -hmm. and the solar kind of energy, um, of the cosmos is orienting us towards the archetype of the virgin or the maiden or the core, depending on how you see her. So yeah, I'm happy to, let's start with our symbols book, because I think that that's always good to give a definition to orient Mm -hmm. us to what we're thinking about. Okay. So this entry is actually under virgin Mm -hmm. um, or virginity, but since the maiden is virginal, we're going to be talking about what that means today. Yeah. I think just as a note for people, we're probably going to be talking about both those terms back and forth throughout the whole thing. Absolutely. They Mm -hmm. both really apply here. So, um, okay. So um, this is coming from the illustrated encyclopedia of traditional symbols. Um, And the Virgin is the soul in its state of primordial innocence, inviolable purity, the pure and passive aspect, the inviolability of the sacred. Virginity is often associated with inviolability. As with the Vestal Virgins, uh, when violation was believed to weaken the magic power and hence the social structure. Um, And so the Vestal Virgins are definitely um, maidens that we will connect with today. The Virgin represents the feminine ideal and is the subject of the struggle, attainment, and protection of the male hero. The Black Virgin symbolizes the darkness of the undifferentiated, the void, and the prima materia. And so that skews more towards dark feminine goddesses Mm -hmm. like Kali. Yeah. Um, And so that is, um, that's what we've got here that we're starting with. Mm -hmm. It's already so much there. Mm -hmm. So I think that something that, you know, we're definitely going to want to kind of pull apart is first of all, like addressing maiden versus is virgin which I think is important because when we say the word maiden, it's almost to an extent like a euphemistic way of saying virgin, right? Mm-hmm. We're, we're saying when, when we're talking about virgin, um, yes, there is an element to it certainly about not having had sex before, right? Being being kind of unviolated. Um, and But we're talking about something much, much deeper when we talk about the archetype of the virgin. And we're, we'll probably get into that in a second. Um, but there's also these threads of the maiden or the virgin as a state of sovereignty and empowerment versus maiden and virgin as something that is 
pure and unadulterated and in some way in service to the masculine. Um, mm-hmm. So we're going to kind of definitely probably hold both of those those meanings for this as we move through today. Yeah, for sure. And I think that um, the concept of like, you know, um, being virginal and being pure and therefore being the the ideal is something that we struggle with and struggle against a lot in contemporary life as women or femme identifying people. Like the concept of purity is just um, stamped onto us as soon as we are born and we're supposed to maintain that purity, but also still not be pure. And so it's a (laughs) triggering topic. And so tell me about it. I came from Catholic (laughs) girls, all girls, Catholic. Yes. You actually went to Catholic school. My parents just threatened me with Catholic school all the time and I probably should have just gone, but I didn't. Oh, it was great. I mean, everyone had their bi awakening. Like I was going to say, I probably should have just jumped in and (laughs) just been there instead of my public high school where there was just chaos reigning Mm. in a very boring way. Yeah. So yeah, so you had the true experience. I had the threat, but we both were raised Catholic. So we both like have this idea of, um, of the Virgin as like the pure state Mm -hmm. of things. And I think that why the reason why it's interesting to talk about the Virgin now is that we're lucky enough to have access to a lot of scholarship that tells us that the concept of um, virginity in a pre-modern or not pre-modern, but in a maybe pre-patriarchal state of being was not about being a good girl and Mm -hmm. not having sex before you were married, Mm -hmm. but it was about being um, autonomous. And so there's this interesting trajectory between autonomy and being like a caged bird (laughs) that (laughs) the maiden kind of goes through uh, over time. And I think that that's one of the things that we're interested in pulling apart today in this conversation. So I, I, that's great to start off because I think when we're talking about the virgin, um, the archetype of the virgin, if we think about, you know, myths of the virgin, we have, we have Mary, but we also have um, Artemis, mm-hmm. we have Persephone, um, though she was violated and so that's part of her story. Um, we have uh, the goddess Sophia, the Gnostic goddess Sophia was often um recognized as a virginal kind of archetype. Um, And I have a quote that we can start with. This is um, from the book, The Feminine in Jungian Psychology and in Christian Theology by Anne Belford Ulanov. The Ulanovs were a married couple who are both Jungians and they're very cute. Um, And so this is a definition of what we're talking about. We're talking about the archetype of the virgin. And she says, in its positive manifestation, the virgin archetype constellates an independence based on fidelity to the feminine principle, one which yields an identity where the woman feels she is a person in her own right and not simply a counterpart to the male. Um, Her sovereign allegiance is to something feminine, the expression and fulfillment of her own feminine goals and purposes, rather than the fulfillment of a male person. And that's kind of what we're talking about um, when we talk about the virgin is that it's, it's excluding relationship with the male um, and with the masculine. And so when we're talking about um, like in the tarot, for example, example, um, we have the high priestess and then we have the empress that comes right after. And these are not opposites, right? These are not like, um, you know, it's not like the high priestess is the dark feminine and the empress is the light feminine. They both hold both of those dualities, but the, um, to me, the high priestess is very much the virgin archetype, whereas the empress is that mother archetype. So there we have that kind of polarity between them of the virgin saying, I am sovereign within myself. I am not in relationship to the masculine principle and the empress being very much in relationship to just partnership in general, right? And kind of being, and she's the bearer. So she has to be in relationship with the masculine in order to gestate new life and just to other things beyond herself in order to grow. Um, Whereas the high priestess is like, leave me alone. I don't need to talk to you if I don't want to. (laughs) I'm chilling. (laughs) Um, And so I think that that's, when we think about the older mythologies um, and stories and the archetypal essence of the virgin, this is really what we're talking about. We're talking about the woman in her self-sovereignty. Whether she has sex or not is really irrelevant, but it's about her kind of standing in her own power and saying, this is the power that's mine. And it's in service to my own exploration of, of my power that is 
very specifically feminine. Um, and of course, we get all messy when we're like, what does femininity mean? And define femininity. And we're not even, it doesn't even matter. It's like, what is that experience for the woman, right? For the virgin herself? What does that feel like? What does that feminine, uh, archetypally feminine power feel like for her? Mm-hmm. Um, so that's kind of what we mean when we're talking about that older concept of the virgin. Um, so it's actually an archetype that's really powerful. And I think, you know, bringing in the the maiden mother crone triplicity, um, when we talk about the maiden, that's kind of what we're talking about too. The self-sovereign feminine, then the mother who is in relationship with the things that she creates and nurtures, and then the crone who kind of returns that self-sovereignty but has this sort of cosmic perspective around it. There's almost like a detachment from the ego that happens in the crone phase where She's like, I am kind of one with all of wisdom and knowledge and power and all of that stuff. Um, but when we're in the that maiden phase, um, that self-sovereignty is very much attached to her egohood, like her sense of self and her sense of what her power can, what the purpose of her power can be. Um, so that's my spiel. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> On the and virgin. It's, it's great. No, it's totally important to map all of this out. And yeah, no, no. Um, I mean, we can take all these archetypes on their own and say, this is how to analyze them. This is how to think about them. But there is something about the maiden or the virgin where this kind of conversation between being in relationship with something is called into focus. And so in our contemporary understandings of virginity, the virgin, like, it's interesting. She exists as a potential counterpart to the masculine as like a potential mate, but she's devoid of male contact or, yeah. or experience. Right. So that's like this enclosure thing that happens. Um, but it's always kind of almost implied that she's waiting to receive something from the masculine. Yeah. Whereas these earlier mythological versions of the Virgin, um, say she's self-enclosed and therefore self-sustaining. Um, yeah. and I think of uh, Artemis or Diana, you know, who are warriors or, or huntresses, right? They're totally able to um, be sovereign in that way. Athena is another great example. Um, You know, uh, Artemis, as soon as she's born is like the doula for her mother so that her brother Apollo can be born too. So it's interesting that there's this kind of immediate arrival um, onto the scene and the implication that you're already kind of perfect um, without having to be extended uh, by the man or the masculine is, is interesting to me. Um, But I do think that it's curious how the maiden and femininity gets expressed and maybe even kind of convoluted in Mm. um, contemporary kind of, you know, um, conversations about these archetypes. And I think about the anima, Um, in Mm -hmm. the Jungian kind of archetypal landscape. And whenever you talk to me about that, you kind of present it as like, it's important, but like Jung presented it in a a way that's maybe not, not so helpful for us, um, kind of positioning it as like with the animus, but subject to it or something like that. So tell me what what happens there. It's, it's, there's a lot of, you know, thoughts about it. I, I am of the of the school where I'm a little bit skeptical of the anima and animus archetypes, but I don't. I'm not saying that they're, you know, I'm not discounting them. Basically, the idea um, is that Jung Jung kind of worked with this. Obviously, it, there's an image of the feminine um, in male psychology, just as there is a core image of the masculine in female psychology. And so he was very interested in this. What does this mean? What is this about? And he studied a lot of dreams and a lot of myth and a lot of stuff and, and came to the conclusion that there is a soul image in the male psychology that he called the anima. And anima is the Latin word for kind of like animation, the soul, the life breath, right? Um, and so there is this this image of the feminine, which encompasses the male soul. And so there's all these stories about the the male hero seeking the princess, seeking the maiden, seeking the damsel, right? And so it's seeking the soul. It's seeking that connection to the deeper experience of self. Um, And this kind of 
this divine communio, this divine kind of hieroscamos, the sacred marriage of coming together of, you know, the, the self, the ego self of saying like, this is who I am. And then this is the soul within me that I want to bind with. Um, and so that image often was feminine, female. And so there's, you know, he theorized there's stages of it. There's the um, Eve stage, which is like, like um, the the most primordial kind of bare sexual experience of woman, and then there's I think after that is um, the the there's the Helen of Troy stage, which is like the desired feminine. There's the mother stage, which is you know, the, the maternal feminine, and then there's the Sophia stage, which is like the the goddess feminine. And so that was kind of his theory about the anima, which is beautiful. the The issue was a little bit that, you know, he took this idea and then was like, oh, but what about women? <laughs> what do women do? And I was actually, years ago, I was reading uh, Susan Rowland's book, which is, um, I think it's just Jung, A Feminist Revision. And in in this like revisioning of like Jungian literature, she like, uh, you know, comes to the, the anima and she's like, <laughs> so Jung like backed himself into a big problem because he was like, so the anima is the soul and only men have animas and women don't have animas and the animus is not the soul. So therefore women don't have souls. Um, <laughs> Good. <laughs> like, Correct. Very silly. And like, <laughs> obviously he didn't believe that women didn't have souls, but he just, he kind of created this, this like, you know, structure around what this archetype means and looks like. So it's a little bit inflexible sometimes. And a lot of women have, you know, the animus image as well. We have that inner masculine. What, um, I think it was uh, Marie-Louise Monfrons and Emma Young wrote a companion to um, Young's literature on the anima about the animus. And they also gave it several stages. They said that it is, um, there's the Tarzan stage <laughs> of like raw masculine might. And there's the father, of course. And there is the um, the poet lover, the the like hot priest archetype, if, if you will. <laughs> um, and then there is like the Mercurius, the like God mm. figure, right? Um, and so but it's 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 different, right? There's a different feel to it. We don't have all this literature um, with a central heroine who's going off to seek the masculine. Like we don't we don't have that literature. In fact, all the stories that center a maiden, that center the heroine, she's still seeking the feminine. She's still seeking that. And so mm. that's kind of where I'm like, what is this? Where where do we actually find the truth in this? Because I know there is truth. I just kind of on that that boundary of like I don't know quite yet. But I think that in terms of speaking of the maiden and this anima image, you said something before that was that really made me um, kind of think about the way that the the male lens, the male perspective, the male ego, um, fetishizes the image of the the maiden that must be attained. Right. So we have the natural. I think that there is this natural archetypal thing in the male psyche, at least according to Jung and depth psychology, that says. We're seeking the soul and the soul image is pure, right? And the soul image is, is everything that we're not. It's beautiful. It's gentle. It's, um, you know, it's full of grace and nurture and all of these things that my dumb male brain can't, <laughs> doesn't know about. So I'm seeking this opposite within me, right? And, and that's beautiful. Um, and yet, of course, we know that in contemporary society, that image of the feminine has become the standard for what women are expected to, to be. Um, we have taken the archetype and made it the, the, uh, the trope, the role that, that we're, uh, must fit into. And this is because of patriarchy. Um, so that was a lot of rambly thoughts, but, uh, that's something that I'm thinking a lot about how we, you know, we've have fetishized this idea of what that maiden needs to look like. And, and it's especially in its, in its ideals of purity and beauty, um, and inviolability as you said. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which is quite limiting because we're people. And I think yeah. that, What's cool about the earlier mythological versions of Kore or or maiden or virgin is that um, they are very complex figures. They just happen to have this quality about them that 
really centers their uh, sovereignty, right? So whether you're talking about the Vestal Virgins or you're talking about Persephone or you're talking about Pallas Athena, it's all about finding the center within within the self. And so um, maybe I'll give like some mythic like context and then we can turn to the Saffron Rossi and yeah. uh, get some guidance on what that term Kore or Virgin might actually mean. Um so, okay, I want to kind of start thinking about the Vestal Virgins because that's uh, a really interesting image trope situation, right? So in, in ancient Rome, the temples or temple of Vesta was kind of tended to by um, these virgin um, temple priestesses. And I'm sure that Vesta is not the only goddess who had virginal temple priestesses, but Vesta's very nature is about that kind of self-enclosure of the virgin. So that was the main feature of being a Vestal virgin. Mm-hmm. Um, Vesta is the goddess of the hearth space and the center of the home. And so it's got this kind of like, um, you know, centralizing, grounding capacity to it. And she was very important for keeping people safe and keeping the domestic sphere you know, protected. And also I think, um, giving a sense of sacredness to the everyday. That's what I think about Mm -hmm. when I think about Vesta. And so she had temple fires that were not allowed to go out. The temple priestesses were responsible for keeping those flames lit. Um, and so in astrology, the Vesta glyph actually looks like a little kind of votive with a flame coming out of it, which is really, really beautiful. But the Vestal Virgins were not allowed to let those flames go out. If they did, they would be in a lot of trouble and they would be basically put to death. So it was a very extreme situation. But <laughs> yeah, a lot of trouble. Yeah, they would really, that would be it for them. And that's terrible. But um, they were also responsible for um, sacred sexual rites that would happen in the temple. And so that would create more... Um, more children to be attendants at the Temple of Vesta. And um, they're, again, the, having this kind of self-enclosed, sacred, divine role um, as the feminine um, was really, really important. And so to be a Vestal Virgin, you would give 30 years of your life to the temple, to the goddess, which is interesting because that's the length of a Saturn cycle. And, oh, interesting. You know, so it's like if you're born in the temple, by the time you have your first Saturn return, you can then go be free. You can become a citizen. You can own property. You can be, um, you know, you don't have to get married. You're not expected to follow the same rules as the rest of the women in that landscape. So that's a very like, you know, that's like religion, mythology, ritual, practicality. That's the best all um, idea. And I think that that's, it's, it's interesting. I mean, yeah, totally. who doesn't have fantasies about running away to become a nun? You know, like I, did. I know that. Yes. <laughs> a lot. <laughs> um, you know, it, it, I had this like crazy thought while you were talking. I was like, wow, did Christianity literally just take the idea of Vestal Virgins and put it upon their priests and just, <laughs> wow. and then just take away the actual like nuance of it? That's... Did they steal that? <laughs> That's really interesting. Yeah, That's what priests do. They also have to be virgins for Christ. Mm -hmm. Not that they're just because they're like the idea of the Vestal Virgin is that she is a virgin, I'm assuming, because she's not she's supposed to be so devoted to to the goddess. Right. Mm -hmm. To like that. So she's not supposed to be in relationships with others that would take her away from that devotion. Um, And that is exactly why priests can't marry. Mm hmm. Mm. Yep. Seems like an overlap there. And it's a Roman tradition. So I wouldn't be surprised if like eventually the, you know, the church stole that kind of concept and imported it. And that's what happens. Um, Very interesting. So yeah. So yeah. We can add priests to our list of virgins. um, I love that. conversation. (laughs) Priests Priests can be maidens too. They can. They can. Um, Oh, wow. Okay. Well, anyway. Um, I think that the most familiar virgin story that we have in, you know, Greek myth is the story of Persephone. Yep. Right. And so I think that a lot of people who listen to this show are like very 
aware of this myth, but in case anybody is listening and they've never heard it before, I'll tell the story really quickly and then we'll kind of think about um, this concept of the maiden here because it's a little bit different, but it still Mm -hmm. gets us to the same place, I think. Um, So usually in myths, you know, virgin goddesses are totally untouchable. And if you try to, if a man tries to approach them, they'll be just like torn to shreds, right? Like thinking mm-hmm. about um, what happened to was it? Who is it that saw uh, Artemis in the in the Actaeon? Forest? Mm-hmm. He got ripped apart by his own dogs. He was he got not turned okay. into a stag, yeah. and that's a huge that's that's a bummer for him. But <laughs> yeah. you know, <laughs> that's what would happen. So if in you know, typically in the myths, it's a great example. If if a man even saw a virginal goddess um, in a state of undress or just vulnerability, you know, the gods would come and just totally smite them. You would be smote. But in the Persephone story, we have a little bit more of a complex narrative. So Persephone was a maiden. She's the daughter of Ceres or Demeter. And she is, um, Ceres is the goddess of the harvest. So she's like an earth goddess, kind of like the empress in the tarot, I think a lot overlap there. Persephone is her daughter and they were known as this like beautiful shining pair of, you know, uh, a mother daughter duo that was un unseparatable. Um, but Persephone was picking flowers as maidens often are in stories. It's always the virgin who like goes off to pick flowers and then something bad happens to them. Yeah. It's, it's funny, but, um, her uncle, Pluto, Hades, sees her picking flowers and is like, I must have this woman for my bride. Um, And the earth opens up and he takes her down into the underworld and makes her be there with him. And so the way that the earth closed itself back up magically, there was no scar. There was no indication of struggle, except I think her her flowers got left behind, Um, probably a symbol of that virginal purity being left Mm -hmm. behind Mm -hmm. and then um her mother goes on this very long and anguished search um and in her grief she creates the first winter she's like doesn't let the crops grow um because she's just so devastated that her daughter is separated from her and missing um and so eventually persephone is located with the help of hecate and helios um so the crone Mm -hmm. um goddess of the crossroads and then the god of the sun Um, and basically Demeter goes to, um, to her brother, Zeus, Jupiter, and is like, you have to give her back to me. Um, but Persephone had eaten six pomegranate seeds while she was in the underworld. And as a result of that, they negotiated that she would spend six months of the year with her mother in the day world and six months of the year underground with her husband and that's when winter would happen and Mm. spring and summer would happen when she was above ground. So it's really an early agricultural myth. And that's what um, is kind of being denoted in a practical sense here. Ritualistically, this was reenacted every year at the Eleusinian mysteries. Um, But we also have this idea of what happens to Persephone. She becomes the queen of hell and that is her title. And she does not have children of her own. Um, but she is one who found, I think, a sense of still self-enclosure and therefore individuation through shadow and through chaos yeah. and through yeah. violation. So she's a very powerful example of the maiden in its maybe slightly darker formulation, but she is known as the Kore. She's Kore Persephone. Right. Kore just means virgin, um, as we'll right. see. So yeah, how does that like how does that story make you feel in your brain? <laughs> make me feel. Well, first of all, I love Christina's story time. It's so delightful. It's like ASMR. I always said that you'd be very gifted at ASMR. Um, <laughs> I think that it's it's gorgeous. I think that the idea of there's I was thinking as you're talking of like how much Persephone and um, Demeter are like mirroring that high priestess empress duality and and partnership in the tarot, which is very beautiful. Um, Because even though she is taken by Hades, um, she's not, she's not, she doesn't lose that autonomy. Um, And it makes me also think of the, we talked about this a little bit before, um, hopping on the, the black virgin, the black Madonna, who is a figure that I've worked with, very intimately thought a lot about. And essentially the black Madonna is, um, 
she there's not like lore around the black it's not like a myth of the black madonna she is there it's a phenomenon that in between the like 12th and like 15th 16th centuries many of the images of mary who is the archetypal virgin who is untouched um so in this time period there's a lot of you know archetypal scholars have thought about what this black madonna means why did all of these images of mary turn black some of them turn black from like the ash and the soot in the churches some were made black used a very dark wood or they were painted black like what what was this phenomenon about because we're in europe here (laughs) where there's very white marys (laughs) because there's very white people um and so they the more that they studied them and the way that they were worshipped and appreciated and the way that they held immense power they had entire cults we talk about cults today a lot but they had real cults back then where people like when i was in provence i saw a few of these cults where there are people who men who are in service to the Black Madonna. Like that is their job. Their job is to be in service to this Black Madonna and do everything they need to do to protect her and keep her safe. Um, and so they worshiped her, not as the mother of Christ, who's this kind of like, oh, that's nice. She's the mother of Christ. We have a lot of reverence for her. She's very pretty, whatever. Um, but no, like there is power here. Um, and she has no relationship to the masculine. Yes, Christ is her son, but it's really about her and not like so much her relationship to Christ. Um, And that is kind of that, that idea of the black Madonna, the black virgin, that she owns the power in and of herself. Um, And so she's not an opposite to Mary or the white goddess, but she is this kind of darker, there's a darker undertone there. There's a little bit of this kind of Persephone edge of being in the underworld um, and having a foot there that is really, mystifying and exciting. Um, Marion Woodman has an entire book about the dark goddess, which I highly recommend. It's so Mm. good. Um, But yeah. Yeah, no, I love that so much. And I think that it's interesting that even though we have such a strong image of the feminine, of the maiden in these archetypal kind of, um, you know, like in, in the way that we think about archetypes and how people value the different states of being a person, right? Being a maiden is part of that experience for some of us. Um, There is always this kind of suggestion that there is a darker like version uh, of something, almost like the shadow of it. And I think that when we consider uh, women today who are self-possessed and sovereign, we always attribute that kind of air. Well, I don't, but people, our society will attribute that um, like that to her being frigid or that to her being mm-hmm. cold or that to her being um, not warm enough and therefore not truly feminine, not in her femininity, more in yeah. her masculine. And I think that that's a mistake because yeah. we really, the quarry is about that sort of sovereignty that is not just about the masculine. Um, right. So yeah, I think that there's something there. I so. think there is something there. I mean, I was just, so for those of you who don't know, my husband is a game designer. Um, He created a board game with his partners, a company called Panic Roll. It's called Townsfolk Tussle. um, And it is a very impressive and very cool game. It's in the style of like Cuphead of like old, like, you know, Mickey Mouse Disney era. It's, it's wild, a little gruesome. It's very, very cool. I am not a big game person, <laughs> but I, I can appreciate. This is something we've bonded over many times. We yes, I don't games. like to play games. I like to drink wine. And don't talk. invite me over and make me play a board game. I want to gossip and I, I want to have drinks. I want to so. gossip and have wine, and that's all I ever want to do. And um, smoke a cigarette but, out the window. Just yeah, kidding. smoke like a cigarette. That. Out the window. <laughs> that's exactly the perfect <laughs> evening. You're telling me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, like, you know, he has no interest in young. I have no interest in board games. So we're even, um, but alas, his game is very, very cool. <laughs> and we were playing it the other day and he has this character, um, it was like a villain and her name is, oh, I can't remember exactly her name, but her name is like frigid air or frigid something or whatever. And she's a refrigerator. And I was like, is this a dig at frigid women? And he was like, what are you even talking about? And I was like, <laughs> Come on. (laughs) Um, And it reminded me that when I was, I don't know, when I was in my early 20s, I was like going through my grandfather's library and he would hide books he didn't want my grandmother to find like in the back. So I found like a a book on like sex magic, which was crazy to me. Oh my God. (laughs) 
<laughs> I know, isn't that wild? <laughs> it didn't even look like he ever opened it, but like he got he it. He had it. Yeah, he had it. <laughs> um, and he also had a book on how to deal with frigid women. Um, and <laughs> I have that on my shelf just like for for kicks because I'm like cool. And it was like published in like 1951 or something like that. Oh my god, um, that's but that, wild. That is that is that's the archetype of the empowered feminine is the frigid woman, right? Like mm-hmm. she doesn't want to be in a relationship with the, the man. Like she wants to have her own autonomy. She doesn't have any time for you. Right. Don't How care. dare you? How dare you be busy in your own right? I don't I want mean. to nurture you and I don't want to fulfill that archetypal role for you. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that that is very much this proof of how much patriarchy has um, imposed their, you know, the, it's it's so finicky because it's like, I feel like, you know, we don't want to take away the natural impulses of the of that male psyche of like that male archetype of like, we want the maiden. That's beautiful. And that's powerful. And I don't, we won't, don't want to strip it. We just, in patriarchy, the archetypes become repressed and then projected outwards, mm-hmm. right? And so we just have to live through it. And so this is what we are experiencing with the Disney movies and the Disney maidens, um, because there are all these images of this kind of perfect maidenhood. And yet a lot of girls, myself included, a lot of young people, period, were like in love with these princesses, in love with these images, um, because- for all that, um, you know, Disney gets hate hate for these stories. I think they were doing their best for the 90s. You know what I mean? <laughs> like totally. we were still very much in the, in the patriarchy. Um, and yet, you know, with Belle, she, she loved to read and she loved to explore her mind and her intellect. And for um, Ariel, she was so passionate. She had real passion about wanting to explore another side of the world. And so they did have, you know, tastes of that independent femininity, even if they didn't realize it all the way through. And also people can want to marry the prince. Mm -hmm. (laughs) That's okay too. And that is how a lot of these stories end because it is symbolic of, especially in a patriarchy, the prince, the king is symbolic of of sovereignty. Mm -hmm. And so her marriage to that is not saying, oh, she really wants a man. It's saying that she has achieved that sovereignty. She's bound herself to the the archetype that holds the sovereignty. And I think that there is something to be said in that. Um, I'm all worked up because of the, all this stuff happening right now with the, uh, the Snow White thing. And, and, you know, she's, what was her face? Whatever that actress is, was like, you know, we don't want to make a story about a girl who gets stalked. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I don't like, know how she decided that the prince stalks her. He's in that, he's in the Disney cartoon for like two scenes, basically. Yeah, he, he sings like, doesn't at the well, eventually. And then he comes and he saves her at the end with a kiss. It's definitely yeah. not stalking, but that's it's, okay. It's a little silly, but alas, this is, this is the, the, um, what is it? I've read somewhere that it's, uh, they call it like Disney feminism where mm-hmm. it's like we, and this is, I'm going to get on a little tangent, but I think it's worth talking about. Um, I have a strong belief that a lot of the feminist heroines, the maidens, the, uh, many of them are maidens. We don't have a lot of stories where it's like, hi, I'm a mom of three kids and I have right. a journey to go on. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so is the maiden, right? But you know, it's usually the hero who's also that kind of counterpart of the young, the young un, unassociated, you know, male figure. Oh, fine, whatever. Um, All of these maiden uh, figures who go out on these journeys and their their maidenhood, that power, that that archetype of the virgin that is sovereign and wise and draws from her own you know power within her femininity, is just replaced with the the masculine images of power that we have. Um, Like I absolutely despise rings of power. Come at me, I dare you. I will not back down on that. It was horrible. Um, And like the image of Galadriel, she lost all of her magic absolutely because the the uh, crone sort of maiden image that she was in Lord of the Rings, that Galadriel who like has this, basically the high priestess who has this well of wisdom that's at her disposal. She's a little scary and she's so beautiful and she owns all of this. With this new Galadriel in Rings of Power, she's like, I'm a boss girl, babe, and I can fight good with my sword and I don't need a man. I don't need anyone. Um, and that is not what the feminine teaches us. Ever. The feminine in, in any iteration does not ever teach us that we don't need anyone. Even the virgin says, I am empowered within myself. I don't need someone else to give me power. I don't need a source of that power. It's my own. And yet it's not, as proved with the Vestal Virgins, 
it's not excluding my ability to be in community um, and to to work together with with the world and nature and you know whoever else is part of the story here. Um, it's like Mulan. Did you see the new Mulan? No, with but Mulan I love the cartoon. And the I was cartoon terrible. is like one of the most brilliant things Disney's ever done because like Mulan goes off and she's a soldier and she's like oh, damn, I don't know how to be a soldier. I'm not really very good at this, which she wouldn't, of course. She's never really had to do that before. And so she has to find her own innate skills and her own innate power. Maybe I'm not the best at swords, but I can climb. I am fast. I am clever. I am all these things. Um, And so she finds the strength and that warrior energy within herself because she finds her own skills. And then in the new one, they're just like, oh, you know, it'd be great, like, karate jumping flying she can she can shoot anybody blindfolded she's just magical so I'm, there's my rant on <laughs> contemporary maidens in in our stories um and heroines and what they're lacking yeah no it's it's it is that way because the weird ways in which the maiden has been repressed and then projected and distorted onto our contemporary world is really um, unfair and unnuanced. And so I'm going to read from Saffron Rossi's book, The Quarry Goddess, to situate us back into that older definition and see if we can, you know, just really kind of tie these together or or just kind of resituate the mm-hmm. idea of the maiden as it existed first. And I think that we never want to say, oh, just because something is older doesn't mean it's better. Although I am a very nostalgic person and I always believe that the past was better than right now, but that's a different conversation. I think that (laughs) we know that the past was flawed, but I do think that the earlier formations of virginity and maidenhood are so much more robust and rich. And it's um, the concept of the quarry, basically, Rossi's whole book is about the idea that we don't need to be young women in order to tap into the quarry archetype. Being of quarry mindset or quarry energy is just of this um, kind of self ownership, and anybody can be quarry. Even older goddesses, um, you know, are often quarry, even though they are not, you know, teenagers or whatever. Yeah. So. Yeah. I think that this is important because what we want to do is remind, I think, everybody that we can access this archetype. It's something that's kind of been not taken from us. It's very melodramatic, but it's something that's been distorted unfairly. And actually, it's a much more fulfilling tool to reach for than what I think a lot of like corporate feminism gives us now, which is like that girl bossing, you know, princess heroine who can have it all like. It's just a mess. So anyway, (laughs) okay, here we go. So I'm going to read a little bit. So um, Rossi writes, in Greek, kore, the word, comes from the root for vital force as the principle which makes life grow. Though the kore is most often depicted as a young woman, the word connotes youthfulness, not a particular number of years. We learn from Aeschylus, the ancient Greek tragedian, who called the three Graii ancient maidens, Denae Kore, um, that one can be aged and Kore, their gray hair crowns beautiful, youthful cheeks. Um, so the Graii are just kind of like three witchy crone um, figures in, in myth. So um, she goes on, there is a curious feature in the birth stories of Kore goddesses in Greek myth, for unlike Zeus, Hermes, and Dionysus, who are born as babies, Kore always takes her first breath immediately as a young woman. Mm. Athena springs from her father's head full grown. Artemis is born a young girl, immediately serving as midwife to her mother. And we first meet Persephone as a blossoming maiden in the fields. Not only does this just so mythic phenomenon convey the profound significance of the quarry in Greek religion, but also its archetypal gravity. I'm going to keep going for a little bit. I'm sorry, yeah, this I'm, is long. I'm very into it. Please it's very me. good. It's yeah. very good. Um, while the quarry may be generally unknown, her associate, the virgin, is immediately recognizable. Synonymous with quarry is parthenos, virgin or maiden, which denotes a woman who is unwed. 
Both Kore and Parthenos are found in Greek literature and religion as epithets of many goddesses, like Kore Persephone, most often translated simply as virgin goddess. And while Kore and Parthenos are often used synonymously, they are not simply equivalent, as Kore suggests something of the essential, vital force that is particular to each person, whether she is goddess or mortal. So she goes on for a bit talking about how Jung kind of approached the idea of um, the Virgin. And to kind of cap this off, um, she writes, these expressions of the active power and independence of the Virgin crystallize the authority she symbolizes. Like the goddesses who bear their divinity in their own right, the woman who is psychologically virgin is one in herself and does what she does not because of any desire to please or to be liked or be approved, not because of any desire to gain power over another, but because what she does is true. So I'll stop there. Obviously, I could read this entire book to you all because it's totally fascinating, but um, the idea here of this, this sovereignty mm-hmm. is what's most important to me as a Virgo, right? I'm, I'm a solar Virgo. And so I think mm-hmm. about this archetype and how to revive it a lot of the time when I'm thinking about my own experiences, the way that we talk about the Virgo sign is like, you're a neat freak, you're critical, <laughs> you're, um, like fussy and uptight. And while I may be particular, and I'm definitely critical. Um, I'm not that well organized <laughs> and I'm, I'm passionately emotional. And a lot of my experience as myself, and I think this, you don't have to be a Virgo for this, but one of my main struggles is kind of like finding that self sovereignty. It's something that yes. happens over and over and over to me in my life. It's like, mm-hmm. who are you, Christina? Are you in relationship with um, these other factors or are you yourself? And so I think that that's one of the most important pieces of the Virgo archetype in general. Um, As Virgo is ruled by Mercury, who is both a day world messenger and an underworld guide, Virgo also has the ability to kind of open into those darker spaces. The Virgin does that too. Um, And we see that in the Vestal Virgin or in the Persephone archetype. So I think that to re-situate the maiden, it is to say Yes, maybe she doesn't have the extent of life experiences that the mother or the crone has, but she is moving from a place of vital truth as her centering detail or archetypal principle. And that's what makes her special, I think, in this way. Right. So, yeah. What do you think of that? I think that that's perfect. I think that's the perfect way to pull all of this together. We, We went a lot of different places and we pulled out a lot of of themes with the maiden and it, you know, as the more we were talking, the more I was like, how do we do this in an hour? Yeah. Um, it's totally one of those conversations <laughs> that's like, it could go forever. Yeah. Um, but I think that this perfect way to pull it in and close it and, and maybe we can all get a little bit closer to finding that maiden and that truth within ourselves. And maybe now we turn to a symbol. All right, let's do it. If you're enjoying this podcast, we encourage you to leave a review or learn more about how you can support us on Patreon, where you can get access to some exciting exclusive offerings. Or you can connect with us by sharing a symbolic experience, whether from a dream or synchronicity, for us to explore on the show. Thank you to today's sharer, and please tell us your symbolic experience or connect with us on our website, soarmysticapodcast.com. Are you a small business looking to reach a targeted audience of people interested in all things esoteric? If this sounds like you, Soar Mystica would love to invite you to become an ad partner. We offer a highly tailored audience of mindful, curious, depth-seeking listeners, and we would be delighted to showcase your business and offerings to new hearts and new minds. Simply fill out an advertiser application form at our website, linked in the show notes below, or navigate to soarmysticapodcast.com forward slash advertise with us. Looking to ground and enrich your manifestations and release any stagnant or negative energy that may be causing resistance? This could be a great opportunity to receive supportive Reiki and intuitive energy healing from Tangerine Sage Healing. 
Stephanie creates a serene capsule for Usui and Holy Fire Reiki, intuitive energy healing, and multidimensional intuitive guidance readings for those who are seeking relief and are ready to ground newfound inspiration and abundant manifestation into one's most authentic self and life. Use code Tangerine Sage at checkout to receive 25% off your first session when you book at tangerinesagehealing.com. And I am myself a loyal client of Tangerine Sage. So once you've booked your session, go over to our Instagram at Sora Mystica Pod and let us know that you've done so and we'll send you a free archetypal tarot meditation kit as a gift to you. So go ahead and check out tangerinesagehealing.com. Hi everyone, Christina here. The School of Divine Sympathies, a foundational course in mythic astrology, is a 10-week immersion in the art of chart interpretation for those who love astrology but want to learn to blend poetry, myth, and magic into their chart reading. This class brings the building blocks of the natal into conversation with mythic tales, and practical interpretive technique is bolstered by archetypal exploration. Empower and enchant your astrological eye by joining me when class starts October 5th. Get all the details of registration, including early bird offers, bonus seminars, and more at the link below or at my website, which is just www.christinaforella.com. Okay, so this listener symbol um, focuses on a scorpion, the symbol of the scorpion. And they write to us, I wanted to share a dream I have been having And lately, I just can't get enough sleep because I keep having this dream where a small scorpion walks on my body and that someone I love warns me about it and I take the scorpion and kill it. Last time I had a different experience as I tried to kill the scorpion, it bit me. So you're a Scorpio. What do you think (laughs) about the idea of trying to kill a scorpion in your dreams? Horrifying. Mm -hmm. Um, Scorpions are so scary. Have you ever seen one? Yeah, at like the Bronx Zoo. Oh. <laughs> in the bug room. <laughs> Get out of here. <laughs> Have you ever seen one in person? Yeah. I yeah. um because I, I did a show in uh, Arizona. Oh my god. Um, and I was there for like three months. So I remember I was at like a we had like some kind of cast party or something at someone's house and the like owner, the theater owner's house. And he had like a kid. Um, the kid was like, let's go find scorpions. Um, and there is a certain kind of scorpion there that I forget the name of it, but it's like, it's like white. It's like the color of sand. It's like a Mm. cream color. And those are apparently like completely deadly or something. And so he was hunting them and like captured one and was like showing it off to people. And I was like, that is not, please don't. They were, they told us when we first got there, they were like, here's your orientation. Black scorpions, you'll be fine. White scorpions, run. I was like, okay, wow. great. That's um, so interesting because of what we think usually about the duality of like dark and light. Like mm-hmm. The, mm-hmm. Yeah. But obviously yeah. that's like a camouflage guy. He's like super deadly. Yes, so he's very deadly. Um, so no thanks. They're very, very creepy. It was so tiny too. It was like this big. It was like maybe oh like an inch or two. It was like so small and, and very scary and looked like, oh my God, that will kill me. Um, so I think that scorpions, we know that scorpions are, uh, deadly, right? We think of them as being deadly. They are, um, I believe that they're in the same family as spiders, right? Like they're mm-hmm. very close to, to spiders and they are bugs, but they're like bigger and hor- more horrible than bugs. Um, and one of the things I think about scorpions is that they have like a trickster energy about them too. Mm. Um, we know that the, the story of the scorpion and the, I guess it is the frog right? Scorpion and the frog. Mm-hmm. Where the frog, the scorpion's on, on the bank of the pond and he's like, hey frog, take me to the other side of the pond. And the frog's like, no, you're going to sting me. And he's like, no, I won't. Why would I do that? We'll both die um, if I sting you because you'll drown. And the frog's like, okay, good point. And then he gets on the frog's back and they go and then he stings them. And he's like, why would you do that? And we're both going to drown. And he's like, because I'm a scorpion. That's what I do. <laughs> I can't help it. Um, Mm. and so there is this kind of like trickster nature about them. And like, we have a couple stories like that where they're very scary and they're very dangerous and their danger is not like, it's, it's their primary principles that they cannot, like in that story, cannot control itself. It's dangerous actually above that. Um, so I would say having a dream about a scorpion, there's, yeah, it's very scary. There's something very dark and very, um, threatening, 
that this is representing here. Um, and then it sounds like you have a couple dreams or at least one where it's just walking on you. So it's just the threat of the scorpion. And then the second time you have the dream, it, it bites you. Um, that's, and you're trying to kill it. So there's, you're not succeeding in destroying it with force, right? And just like, ah, get off me or go away or I'm going to destroy you. Um, it's surviving it and it's actually getting closer to to launching at you, attacking you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's the intense. scorpion is like really um, just, it's, it's malefic, um, mm -hmm. right? It's a little bit dark and um obviously it's full of poison it has multiple mm -hmm. ways to kind of wound and so i would be interested to know like what a scorpion kind of means because i think that we all have different takes on what these animals represent um it sounds like this person feels that the scorpion is threatening and i think that that's interesting yeah. scorpio or sc sorry scorpions also to me in astrological framework when we think about the symbol of Scorpio, we have three animals that it's attributed to. Mm -hmm. One is the Phoenix, one is the Eagle, and the last one is the Scorpion. And they kind of go in like this vertical order, like the Phoenix yeah. is the highest, Eagle is the middle, and Scorpio is the closest to the earth. Um, it's one that's not able to fly, obviously. And so it's associated with like the libidinal drive yeah. in Scorpio. Yeah. Um, and so I would be curious about like what – what kind of like uh, repressed desire? Oh, that's a is, good question. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, because like in that story of the Scorpio and the frog, like that is its key desire is just to sting. Like it doesn't mm -hmm. have another possibility and it can't resist the, the desire to sting. So there is something very libidinal in that. And when we say libido, libidinal, we don't mean sex all the time. Just right. as a note, we mean like the – this like in this passion energy within this life force energy, this drive. Um, so there is like this, this lust almost to like fulfill this, this desire, which is very dangerous and dark and, and sneaky mm -hmm. um, and, and can kill you, can like completely destroy you and poison you. I like that. That's an important thing. Whenever we were dreaming of animals and I learned this from, from, you know, my own analysis, we can definitely use our symbols books and, and use those resources to discover their general archetypal meaning. But also it's really useful to just get into the nuances of that particular animal, mm -hmm. right? Like why is it a scorpion and not a bee, right? Mm -hmm. Like a bee mm -hmm. that stings you. Scorpions are more dangerous, right? It can kill you. A bee probably wouldn't. Um, why is it a scorpion and not like a wolf, right? Mm -hmm. These are also both dangerous things. So why is it a scorpion crawling on you and not a wolf that comes in and attacks you? So you can kind of like pull out the nuances of the creature. And you're right, the, the scorpion, it poisons, right? Rather than ravages, it doesn't tear you apart. It poisons you. Like you get a poison through the blood and, and that's how you are killed. So there is something, just as you were saying, like almost secret, like it's spreading, right? Like there's this thing about it that it might infect you. Um, so I would definitely be curious what, if that, you know, gets any, any juices, things flowing in your mind, if that triggers anything for you, li mm -hmm. uh, listener. Yeah, no, I think in the dream, the person is warned by somebody that they love about the scorpion kind mm, of walking yeah. on them. So I wonder, like, obviously this sounds to me like an anxiety dream and in one mm -hmm. formulation, just kind of like, what are you holding on to that you're feeling like unsafe about, or that there's this kind of nocturnal um threat like scorpions to me i don't know they seem like an animal that would be nocturnal but i'm I not they completely, are. yeah i think so i'm not positive they're also hunters um and so mm. wondering about the feeling of being hunted too as like yeah. you know the scorpion kind of crawling on you and trying to have its way with you feels very much like what's the how why are you feeling vulnerable right now? And yeah, how there's definitely something stalking stalking you in, in that way that the, it's like coming back a couple times and it's like trying to make you uncomfortable. Yeah. Um, I, I would say the idea of someone that you love warning you, there's almost that kind of, um, I don't know, psychopomp kind of image or that even an anima image, depending on like how mm -hmm. it, it appears of like, like, hey, pay attention. 
Like pay attention to this thing. This is not thing to this is not something to just like ignore. Um, I would say that when we have dreams like this, you might want to look at like, is there something going on in your life right now where you feel a little bit on edge about it? It feels a little scary. Maybe, for example, you're in a relationship that you're kind of like, I don't know if this is quite right for me, or you're, you know, developing a habit you know, in some way, or have a friend who kind of pulls you into the dark side and you're like, maybe I need boundaries here. Whatever that might be, there might be something in your life that feels like it's actually, it has some kind of threat for you, or there's something that makes you slightly uncomfortable about it. I would wonder if you're kind of repressing that discomfort and you're like, oh no, I shouldn't worry about it. It's fine. Or should let, let things play out or something. But then there's a deeper part of your psyche that's like, here's danger. There's danger. Pay attention. Um, that would be my wonder. And of course, you know, some, just something to chew on and think about if that resonates. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well put. Yeah. Cool. So yeah, I think this was a good one. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. Yeah. It was spooky. I hate those kinds of dreams so much. <laughs> um, did I ever tell you about when the cockroach ran up my leg? Yes. That's a horrible story. <laughs> oh God. Once it's on you, I, I empathize with you listener because once they're on your body, that's a hard thing to get out of your brain. Mm. Um, okay. Well, we've spooked ourselves enough and we've talked about the maiden a lot and thank you for going on this journey. This was a, we really got into the weeds there, which was really kind of fun. Mm -hmm. Um, and make sure to check out that archetypal tarot school. If you are a tarot person and want to take your practice deeper, um, and give us a like and, um, a review and all the great things. Um, and yeah, thank you for, for joining. Thanks everyone. See you next time. Thank you for joining us in our conversation today. Please consider supporting the podcast by leaving a review and following Soar or Mystica wherever you listen. You can also become a more active supporter and a member of the Soar or Mystica community by joining our Patreon. If you have a symbolic experience that you'd like to share with us for the podcast, you can tell us all about it at soarmysticapodcast.com. The music for this podcast is written and performed by me, Mariana Lewis, with special thanks to Stefan Lewis. You can connect with both Christina and myself on Instagram and get to know our work by clicking on the links in the show notes. As the alchemical motto goes, as above, so below, as within, so without. May this ancient wisdom continue to guide you deeper. Until next time, take good care.